welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. I'm excited because tonight I want to talk to you about six characteristics of standout Christians. Six characteristics of standout Christians. Now, before we go any further, I, I want to define this term standout so that you and I can understand it so that we're all on the same page. Sometimes we look at the word stand out and we think, well, that's not necessarily a good thing. I don't, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be that one that, 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 that stands out. Or I don't want to be that person that everybody's looking at. But let me give it to you. Uh, Miriam Webster, I thought, uh, did a great job defining it. So I won't try to do anything different, but just read what they have. Stand out is one that is prominent or conspicuous. Listen to this. Especially because of excellence. I love that. One that is, is, uh, is prominent or conspicuous, especially because of excellence. So tonight we're going to talk about six characteristics of standout Christians. Somebody who is prominent. Somebody who is conspicuous or visible. Not because of the clothes we wear. Hallelujah. Not because of our hair or our makeup, or, or the car we drive, or the house we live in, or, or anything of that nature. Not because of anything on the outside, but because of excellence. Six characteristics of standout Christians. Now, all throughout the Gospels, and looking at the interaction of Jesus, all throughout the Gospels, there were people that Jesus Christ came and he interacted with. And oftentimes, there was somebody you'll read about, somebody or you'll read about a story, and Jesus would lay hands on them or he would speak to them and they'd be healed or he would reveal something to them and they would be uh, changed forever or they would walk away sad. I mean, the, Jesus was in the ministry, just like you and I are in the ministry of people. His job, his, his purpose here on earth was to interact with people. But there were some people in the Gospels that stood out because of excellence, because of prominence, because they were conspicuous even though really in life they were inconspicuous, but they got the attention of Jesus Christ. And so as I was reading the Word of God, as I was reading through the Gospels, I was looking at somebody and names and, and, and stories began to just jump out at me. And I started to write some things down. And this all just kind of came together as characteristics of standout Christians. Now, obviously, before we go into tonight's six characteristics, I have to, I have to just give you the obligatory uh, a statement. And that is, first and foremost, the people that we're going to look at, they're not Christians. Why? Because I am well aware that the term Christian did not appear for several decades after Jesus Christ had gone. So we call these, I say, six characteristics of standout Christians. At the time, many of these people weren't even Jews. They're Gentiles. So you and I would look at that and say, well, they're not Christians. But their characteristics that they exercised in their, uh, in their, uh, in their uh, what's, the, what's the word I'm thinking for? In their uh, interaction with Jesus that made them stand out to be preserved in the Gospels, to be written down so that you and I, thousands of years later, could look at the characteristics, to look at these interactions and say, what is it that I can pull out of this story? What does this have to do with me? What can I do? And so we're going to take a look at six characteristics of standout Christians so that you and I could be prominent, so that you and I would be conspicuous. You see, Jesus called us to be conspicuous. I don't know if you knew that. Sometimes we want to just blend into the crowd. Does anybody know what an introvert or an extrovert is? Does, it, does anybody know what that is? An introvert is somebody that, that doesn't naturally like to be around people. Does anybody know what an extrovert is? Well, it's the opposite of that. It's the people person. Generally, when an introvert and an extrovert are in conversation together, the extrovert talks, the introvert stares and gets exhausted. All right? <laughs> The extroverts want to be prominent. They want to speak. They want everybody. Sometimes, you just, have you ever been around somebody that just, you just, they love to hear their own voice? <laughs> then there's the other person that you wonder, are you there? <laughs> the lights are on. Nobody's home. You see, whether we want to be conspicuous or prominent is irrelevant. Why? Because Jesus says as Christians, we are to be conspicuous. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say that you and I are the light of the world. <laughs> I thought Jesus was the light of the world because we have Jesus in us. Now we become the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We are the salt of the earth, Jesus says. What amazing illustration. So you see, you and I are designed by God to stand out, to be different from the world. And some, these are some characteristics of interactions that I believe when we grab a hold of these, when we see these, when we apply these to life, you and I will live that calling that God has for us, and that is to be 
a standout Christian. So today, let's go and look at six characteristics of standout Christians. I'm going to say this, standout Christians, and we'll complete that statement six times. If you've got your Bibles, we're just going to go to the Gospels tonight. We're just going to go and look at some, some uh, uh, interactions with Jesus Christ. We're going to go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm not going to necessarily go in chronological order, but we will work our way from Matthew all the way into Luke. So, we've got some reading ahead of us, but it's some good stuff today. That's why I say we're just going to let the... The Holy Scriptures preach to us tonight. Matthew, the 8th chapter starting out. Matthew, the 8th chapter. Six characteristics of standout Christians. Standout Christians, number one. Understand spiritual authority. Standout Christians understand spiritual authority. Here in Matthew, the 8th chapter, is a man that you and I know as the Roman centurion. Now, as we go further, or before we go any further, Jesus is coming to Capernaum, uh, and here is a, a, a centurion or a Roman, uh, uh, somebody that, is, 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 that Jews don't necessarily want to associate with for several reasons. Number one, he's a Gentile. He's not a Jew. That's, that, that Jews just didn't want to associate with Gentiles. Secondly, he was a military person, kind of just didn't want to be there. Third, he represented Rome, who was Israel's captor at the moment. So there's, there were some things that were just right off the bat working uh, against the favor of this centurion. Now, a centurion in your and I, uh, modern day vernacular, would be much like a lieutenant in a regiment. He was a man who commanded the respect of his, of his fellow soldiers. He wasn't like a general or somebody like that. This was a man that was in the dirt, in the grind, that fought the battles with his soldiers. And here, a Roman centurion approaches Jesus. Now, a couple different illustrations or a couple different accounts say that the centurion came or he sent a servant but wrote, or Matthew in the 8th chapter, Matthew in the 8th chapter, speaking to the subject, they understand spiritual authority. Matthew in the 8th chapter, verse number 5. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. Hey, right off the bat, Jesus is coming to your house. Hey, let's do this. Better go, run, like, like Pastor Dan talked about, better go send a forerunner ahead and tell them to pick up the house. Jesus is coming. But the, the centurion has an amazing statement. Verse number 8, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. But only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I am also a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And I say, lost my place. I say to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, verse number 10, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. What an amazing statement. Jesus turns to his Jewish followers. Some of the men who had been following him, studied or versed in the scriptures or in the, in, in the holy writings. And Jesus turns to them and says, I have not found such great faith in all of y'all. Here's this Roman captor Gentile that just showed you up. And what it is is that he understood authority. You see, the centurion understood authority and Jesus took the authority and equated it to faith. What would it be like when you and I gather and grab a hold of the authority that's been given to us? The name by which we live, like we talked about any other name. We call upon the name of Jesus and we shall be saved. You see, when we grab a hold of the concept of authority, when we grab a hold of the concept of spiritual authority, first and foremost from Jesus Christ to realize that he took sin and death and shame and he nailed it on the cross. I love what Colossians says. He took the enemy and made a public spectacle of him by going to the cross and being resurrected. You see, now Jesus Christ is our high priest. He is our representative. He is our mediator, the Bible says, seated at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for us. Now, all of a sudden, when we have God on our side, we have the principle or we have the ability to grab a hold of authority in our life. You see, you and I don't have to live life 
busted and disgusted. Yes, life is going to be challenging. Life is going to have its hardships. There's going to be troubles from our friends, from our family, from our positions, from just circumstances that happen. But you see, you and I have something special because we are in Jesus Christ. And that is we have authority in Jesus Christ. I love that we don't have to live life afraid. We don't have to live life in fear. We don't have to live life wondering what if tomorrow. Why? Because we know that in Jesus Christ, everything will be okay. And we have a grasp of authority. And here's a soldier that says, I say, do this and it gets done. I say, come here and they come. You and I can understand that we have the authority to say, I'm going to speak what the word says and it's going to happen. I'm going to think what the word says and it's going to change me. We have the authority of the word of God on our side. And a standout Christian understands spiritual authority. We know that we don't just serve a holy man. We know that we don't just serve a wise teacher. We, don't, we know that we don't just follow after the sayings of somebody who lived a few years, a few thousand years ago, wore a white sash and a blue rib, or a, a white uh, uh, a cloak and a blue sash. But no, our words carry authority. Why? Because they come from God. They come from Jesus Christ, the name of names, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And we can bank it. We can bank on it today. We understand spiritual authority so we too could be people like that Roman centurion of great faith. I love it. Verse number, uh, second one for today, standout Christians, number two. Second principle for tonight, standout Christians, number two, persist beyond the apparent. They persist beyond the apparent, which means life is going to look one way, but based on the way life looks doesn't mean we stop. Based on the answer we get at the moment, doesn't mean we quit. Based on where we go or what we see or what we hear, doesn't mean we stop, but rather we persist beyond the apparent. We don't look to today. We don't look to the circumstances. I love that. It says the just shall live by what? Faith. The Bible tells us that we walk by faith, not by sight. Why? Because if we walk by sight, we stop at the apparent. If we walk by sight, we stop at the apparent. We're in Matthew. Let's turn a couple of pages over to Matthew in the 15th chapter. Matthew in the 15th chapter. Here a Gentile woman. Other gospels say that she was a Syrophoenician. Woman comes to Jesus with a request. Matthew in the 15th chapter. Talking about spiritual characteristics or characteristics of, of standout Christians. Number two, we, we persist beyond the apparent. In Matthew, the 15th chapter, look what it says in verse number 21. Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Verse number 23. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away. She cries out after us. Here's a woman in distress. Here's a woman, as a parent, you can relate. When your child is suffering, when your child is going through anguish and turmoil, you'll do anything you can. You'll give anything you can. You'll pay anything you can to relieve the suffering of that child. And here's this woman on a mission seeking after Jesus. And now, now she finds herself with the blessed opportunity to be at, at the feet of Jesus and to, the, to have the ability to ad approach and address him. And here she finds that Jesus ignores her request. That his very disciples are asking Jesus, instead of replying, tell her to get away. See, the parent would say, it's not for me. The apparent, the circumstance, the way things look and appear right now says, go home with your tail tucked between your legs. But look what goes on. Jesus answered her and said, I wasn't sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I wasn't sent for you. Pretty harsh words. So not only does Jesus ignore her request, now he comes and he says to her, my ministry is not for you. My ministry is not for you. You see, the apparent again says, time to go home, time to put your head down, say, well, thanks, sorry about you, and walk away. But look what she says. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. 
But he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Again, again, Jesus says to this woman, this Gentile, this person outside of the Jewish culture, he says to her, not only does he ignore her, not only does he say that his ministry was not for her, now he says, it's not good for me to take what was meant for the children and give it to you, the dogs. Rubbing salt in the wounds so you might see, you see the apparent might seem as though the situation is hopeless. But she comes back. And she says, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. She could have said, you know what, Jesus, forget you. I came all this way and hoped that you would help me. If nobody else can help me, you can't help me either. Here's my sob story. Oh, blah, 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 woe is me. But she says, you know what, you're right. You're called to the children of Israel. But even every once in a while, the dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall off the table. Throw me a crumb. All I need. You see, she was persistent. She didn't stop. She didn't give up. The circumstance, the, 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 the situation, the mood of the conversation seemed like, hey, this conversation is an A and a B conversation, and she should have seen her way out of it. But she said, give me a crumb. Look what Jesus says in verse number 28. Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. You see, again, like that Roman, Jesus says, man, what's the lesson that we would learn here? How many times have we asked God for something in our life? How many times have we prayed, God, give me, God, help me, God, move on my life? And it seems like our prayer fell on deaf ears. It seems like our request went unnoticed. It seems like the timing just didn't work out. And so we say, well, clearly it's time for us to turn around. Clearly it's time for us to back away. Clearly God, his ministry was not for me. But rather maybe it is that God is waiting for you to give him the right answer to your request. Like the, like the woman, the Canaanite woman. She said, listen, just give me a crumb. That's all I need because you're able even with a crumb, not the whole serving, to heal my daughter. And Jesus, all he had to say like the centurion is okay. She's healed. Daughter was healed that very hour because she had great faith and she was persistent beyond the apparent. You and I are going to face ourselves a lot of challenges. There's going to be times when our back's going to be up against the wall. There's going to be times when it seems like everybody's left or everybody's deserted or nobody's on our side. But let me tell you something beyond the apparent, you and I have got to persist. And realize, not like number one, that we have an authority. We have Jesus Christ on our side. And we persist beyond the circumstance at hand. Galatians in the sixth chapter is not even on the overhead. We've said it so many times. It says, do not grow weary while doing good. Why? For in due season we will reap if we don't lose heart. You know what that means? God's got a plan for you and I. And sometimes we just have to sit and wait on God and get through the apparent. But let me tell you something. In due season, we will reap if we don't lose hearts. Characteristics of standout Christians. Number one was they understand spiritual authority. Number two, they persist beyond the apparent. Number three, standout Christians. Number three, oh, I love this one. If you got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Mark. Let's look at Mark in the second chapter. Oh, this one's amazing. It's going to blow your mind. Ready? You ready for this one? It's already on the board. You guys blew it, man. Took the element of surprise. Number three, standout Christians surround themselves with faith. Hey, what do we surround ourselves in our day and age? Is it the TV? Is it the radio? Is it the, the celebrities? Is it the people around us at work? Is it the people we go after work and go hang out with? What do we surround ourselves? You see, standout Christians surround themselves with faith. Standout Christians surround themselves with faith. Oh, I love this. Look at this. Look at, this. Look at, this. Look at the principle here in Mark, the second chapter. Mark, the second chapter, starting in verse number one. Again, he entered Capernaum after some days. And it was heard that he was in the house. I love that. Jesus is in the house. 
All right, I mean, that's just a cool statement right there, right? You gotta just take your pen and just underline that. And it was her that he was in the house. You just say, hey, what, what's going on? Jesus is in the house. Okay, anyway, that's a whole nother message. All right. It was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so there was no longer room to receive them. Not even near the door. I mean, this house is packed. You know, you and I, we have these maximum occupancies. You, you, you look around buildings, you can see how many people can fit until the fire marshal comes and shuts you down. They didn't have that in the day. They had everybody. I mean, has anybody ever been to a third world country or travel around the world? Anybody ever seen a bus? In somewhere other than America. See, in America, you got, you got personal space. I call it man space, right? You got to sit one seat away, man. This is the barrier right here. That's, that's our barrier. No, no, no. You go to another country, or if you've ever been to an amusement park where somebody from another country has, has come from and is visiting, you know they have no concept of spirit or of, of, of personal space. They are going to press against you. So just imagine, you see, we say, oh, nobody will fit in the house. That's because nobody in our house would fit if you and I could go like this or do jumping jacks. But no, 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 no. Get the picture. This is Israel, right? No personal space, which means they are crowded in this house. It is hot. It smells like breath. You got another guy like just breathing on you, okay? It is crowded. Ain't got no space. And he preached the word to them. Jesus is in the house. It's crowded. They're packed. Can't even move. Can't even scratch your head. Your, your arms are stuck at your side. They came to him. I love that. I love that. I just want you to focus really quickly. I don't have it highlighted, but it's all right. Just, if you've got a pen or you've got something, just, just, just highlight it, circle it, underline it. They. Then they. Who's they? They. Look at that, okay? Just, just remember, we're going to focus on the they, okay? The story's about a paralytic, but I want to show you the they, okay? They came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by who's they? Four men, all right? Four men came to Jesus. They came to him. And when they, okay, remember that word they, there it is again, they, when they could not come near him because of the crowd, again, here it is, they uncovered the roof where he was. Now, okay, see, again, things that just don't happen in America in our day and age, all right, they were like, listen, we can't get in the house, let's climb up on the roof, pull all the straw, pull all the thatch, pull all the mud. I'm sure the owner wouldn't mind if they just ripped a hole in my ceiling. So they uncovered the roof where he was, and then they, again, there's that word, they, had broken through. They let down the bed on which the paralytic was laying. Now listen to this. When Jesus saw whose faith? Their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, when Jesus saw the people whom he had surrounded himself with, he said to the man in the bed, your sins are forgiven. You get, I mean, this is, I was reading this and I was just like, you've got to be kidding me. You see, uh, dynamic, standout Christians surround themselves with faith. Here's a man that on his own is nothing. Here's a man that on his own has no ability. But he surrounded himself with people of faith so much so that they got to the door and they said, we can't get in here. They went to the window and they said, we can't get here. They went to the back door and they said, well, we can't get in here. Somebody looked at somebody else and said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? They said, yes, I am. They got a ladder, brought the guy up on the roof, lowered him down. Why? Because they had to get him to Jesus. <laughs> Skipping down to verse number 11. The Pharisees argue with Jesus because of the statement. He says, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus says, well, what's easier to say to somebody, your sins are forgiven or to get up and walk just to show you that I'm the son of God. I'll, I'll tell him the harder one. And he says, to arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Verse number 12 comes on. Immediately he rose and took up the bed and went in the presence of them all so that they, so that all were amazed and glorified to God saying, we never saw anything Jesus saw their faith and said to the paralytic, you and I have got to surround ourselves with people of like-minded faith. Did you know that faith, genuine faith, not, 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 this, not this confession or not this, this, this outward appearance of, but did you know that genuine faith is infectious? Have you ever been around somebody who's just overly optimistic and you can't change it, you can't figure out why, but you spend enough time with them and all of a sudden life seems to be a little bit better? 
When somebody's got great faith, you can't shake it no matter how negative you try to be. No matter what you do, at some point you start to say, well, I guess if they believe it, maybe I should start trying too. You see, when we surround ourselves with people of faith, then all of a sudden we become standout Christians. Somebody that makes a difference in the world. Oh, I love it. I love it. Hebrews 10th chapter. It's not on the open. I'm just quoting it for you just, just for your own sake. It says, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. You have got to make it a point to be around people of faith. All right, number four. You all right with me tonight? You all right with me tonight? All right, number four. We're looking at standout Christians. Number four. Okay. Number four, standout Christians, don't give up. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. Keep on I love it. Keep on trucking. We keep going. You know why? Even when it's hopeless, because of Jesus Christ, we have hope. We're in Mark. Let's go to Mark, the fifth chapter. Look with me in the book of Mark in the fifth chapter. Mark in the fifth chapter. Verse number 25. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Now, I think we all understand what this means. I don't want to get into this. We don't, you know, the guys, we're all like, man, I always skip over this story just because. <laughs> Ultimately, this woman was in, found herself in a bad situation. She had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather she grew worse. Can I paint the picture for you in those two verses? Here's a woman for 12 years, lost everything she had, had suffered many afflictions from the hands of the physicians, meaning that she'd been scammed or, or defrauded by them. She hadn't gotten any better, but rather she's only gotten worse in 12 years. You know what that sounds like to me? A hopeless situation. Okay, 12 months I can handle. Two years, 12 years of her life, she's only grown worse. And so now she finds herself what you and I would think would be a hopeless situation. She's broke, she's got nothing left, she's been defrauded by doctors or physicians, nothing, it's only getting worse. There's no more hope. But look what she says. Look. Verse number 27. When she heard about Jesus, she... Oh, excuse me. Verse number... Yeah, verse number 27. When she had heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. Verse number 28. For she said, If I may only touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Do you know what that means? Do you see what that says? She said, after 12 years of hopelessness, she said, there's still hope. She still had hope. She should have given up. She had no money. The doctors told her she couldn't, they couldn't do anything for her. She had nothing left. She couldn't go out in public. She was unclean. She couldn't, I mean, she had a problem. So nobody wanted to be around her. She was a social reject, hopeless in all circumstances. But yet she still had hope after 12 years to the point she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. She had some hope. I love this in verse number 28, if I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Verse number 29, immediately the fountain of blood, of her, of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. I love this. Verse number 30, Jesus immediately knowing in himself that the power had gone out of him, turned around to the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Love it. I love it. I love the example and in the, in the, what the Bible tells us here. The disciples are scratching their heads, looking at each other like, did he really? Jesus, God, the, the, you know, the, the, the one sent from God who knows all, knows from beginning to the end. Did he really just ask, who touched my clothes? They say to him, you see the multitude thronging you? And you say, who touched me? Okay, thronging. You think about like the, the Oscars or, or celebrity. You know when they get out of the car, you know the paparazzi's that they press in. You can't even touch them. People are just like trying, oh my God, like Justin Bieber kind of thing thronging, getting trampled. This is what's going on. Jesus is walking and people are just touching. All right, They're just pressing in. There's a, you can't even get close and the disciples are like bodyguards trying to give people, hey, hey, back off, give them some space. And then Jesus looks at them and says, who touched me? Everybody? <laughs> but you see, she didn't give up. Not only did she have hope, but she pressed in. You see, it's not easy to get to Jesus when you're at the back of the crowd. You see, she saw him. She pressed in. So that, you know what that means? That means that she pushed through the crowd. Well, you know, at the center of the, of the crowd, where Jesus is, it's tightly knit. I mean, people are trying with all their effort. They're thronging him. They are trying as hard as they can also to touch him. Yet here she is and pushes through 
all of these people who are also dedicated and trying to touch him to the point where she gets to him and touches him. And because of it, she's healed. Jesus says, who touched my clothes? Verse number 31. But his disciples said to him, you see the disciples and you say, who touched me? And he looked around seeing, looked around to see her who had done this thing. Listen to this, verse number 33. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what would happen to her, came and fell down before him and she told him the whole truth. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. She pressed on. She didn't give up. Twelve years of hopelessness and she still had hope. Why? Because she is an example of a standout Christian that you and I can go and look at. And listen, it may seem hopeless, but Jesus Christ is our hope. And therefore, we don't ever have to give up. <laughs> Philippians 3rd chapter, I love it. Paul says, I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ has also laid hold of me. You and I press on. Number five, we'll go, we got to move. Number five, stand out Christians. Number five, stand out Christians. Don't follow the crowd. Stand out Christians. Don't follow the crowd. If you got your Bibles, we're in Mark, the fifth chapter. Let's look at Mark, the tenth chapter. Stand out Christians. Don't follow the crowd. You see, churches all over America, all over the world, are always trying to figure out how we can reach the unchurched by making it seem comfortable to them. So churches have the light shows, we have the, the dark music or the, the dark rooms and, and, and the, 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 the praise and worship that happen. you can't stand anyways. Why do we love it all? But, you know, we try to reach the people. And you know why? Because we're trying to appeal to the crowd. But I love this. Stand out Christians don't follow the crowd. They follow Jesus. Stand out Christians don't follow the crowd. It's not about the music. It's not about the lights. It's not about the stage. It's not about how bright or how dark it is. It's not about whether it's a green church or a gray church. Or It's not about that. It's about Jesus. Mark in the 10th chapter. Mark in the 10th chapter. Verse number 46. Now they came to Jericho and he was out. Speaking of Jesus, he went out of Jericho and his disciples and a great multitude. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And then many warned him, hey, be quiet. But he cried out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. So they called to the blind man, saying to him, Hey, be of good cheer. Rise. He's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Verse number 51, Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabbi, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. See, he was crying out to Jesus, and they said, Hey, shut up. Be quiet. Don't raise a scene. Don't stand out. Don't be a standout Christian. Blend into the crowd. And he said, I'm not going to shut up. Like David, King David said, I will be even more undignified than this. Why? Because it's not about me blending in. It's not about me looking like the person next to me or sounding like the person next to me. It's not about me having this casual Christianity thing. It's about me saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He got the attention of Jesus. Now, uh, uh, listen, remember I said they don't follow the crowd. Now, listen to this. Listen to this. Look at this. Verse number 52. Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Immediately he recite, received sight. And what did he do? He followed Jesus. Do you see that? That his way was not wherever he wanted to go. His way wasn't to the supermarket. His way wasn't to the optometrist. His way wasn't to go buy new clothes because now he could see what color he was wearing. His way was Jesus' way. Jesus said, go your way. Do what you want. And he says, I will follow you. I ain't following the crowd. I'm going your way. Where your way is, that's my way. Stand out Christians. You and I, we don't follow the crowd. We follow Jesus. Last one for tonight. Last one for tonight. Stand out Christians. Number six, humble themselves. Stand out Christians, humble themselves. It is not about us. See, we talk about standing out. We talk about being prominent. We talk about uh, uh, being uh, conspicuous. But in being prominent and being conspicuous, we can lose one of the most important factors of our Christianity, and that is humility. It is not about us. 
We get so wrapped up in prosperity. We get so wrapped up in blessing that we forget to realize that when we are blessed by God, notice how I said when, when we are blessed by God, it's not so that we can have more things, bigger rings and nicer cars. We are blessed by God so that we can bless others so that they can know God. It is not about us. Stand out Christians, humble themselves. We were in Matthew, we were in Mark, let's go to Luke. Luke in the 17th chapter. And we'll finish with this. Luke in the 17th chapter. You guys all right? Doing all right tonight? Luke in the 17th chapter. I gotta move. Talking about standout Christians. Luke in the 17th chapter, verse number 11. Now when it happened as he went to Jerusalem, Jesus, this is, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And there and as he entered a certain village, there met him. Ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. They wouldn't come near. That was the law. They weren't allowed. And they lifted up their voices and they said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was as when they went, they were cleansed. Listen to this. Talking about standout Christianity. And one of them, and one of them, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned with a loud voice and glorified God. He fell down on his face at his feet, grieving him, giving him thanks and saying, and he was a Samaritan. One of them came back to Jesus, an outcast, an outsider, and worshipped him. So Jesus answered and said, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you well. This man stood out. Why? Not because he was healed. Not because God touched him. Not because God did something miraculous in his life. You see, that's what we're all waiting for is a miracle. God's there. He stood out because he humbled himself. He could have gone to his family that he hadn't seen for years. He could have gone and celebrated in the streets. He could have gone out into the marketplace where he had been banned from because of his condition. He could have gone and, and announced to all what had just happened to him, how God had finally given him a miracle while everybody else says, where's mine? But instead the one says, I'm going to prolong all of that and I'm going to go back to the one who gave me what I needed most, my healing, and I'm going to worship him. He humbled himself and came before Jesus, fell on his face, and worshiped Jesus. And Jesus said, was there not nine others? Where is everybody else? You know, all throughout our lives, the Bible doesn't tell us, all throughout the gospel, the Bible doesn't tell us about the nine. So we can't even speculate what happened to the nine. But you know what the Bible does tell us? The Bible tells us about the one. And we know that the one who returned, Jesus said, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. You see, the Bible tells us that God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. All you and I have got to realize is that it's not about us. Stand out Christians humble themselves. Why? So that when we stand out, so that when we're prominent, so that when we're conspicuous, it's not because of us. It's because of Jesus inside of us. That is what makes us stand out altogether. Six principles, six characteristics of standout Christians. Number one, they understand spiritual authority. Number two, they persist beyond the apparent. Number three, they surround themselves with faith. Number four, they don't give up. Number five, they don't follow the crowd. Number six, they humble themselves. Hey, you and I can be standout Christians. Did you guys get something out of the word of the Lord tonight? Amen. I want to ask you a very serious question. We've had a good time. We laughed. You know, cried in the spirit of God. Let me ask you this question. You know, it'd be a shame for us to do all that and not give you the opportunity to examine yourself. You see, the Bible says that we ought to examine ourselves from time to time. So I want to ask you a question and I want you to answer it honestly. You see, nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. And here it is. If you were to leave tonight and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Simple question. See, nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. Let me ask you this. 
Based on your answer, what makes you think you're going to get to heaven? What makes you think you're going to get to heaven? You say, yeah, I'm going to go. What makes you think so? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible are you going to find that you can think, hope, or wish your way to heaven? Positive thinking, positive outlook on life, self-betterment is going to get you there, becoming a better person. You're not going to get to heaven because you think so, because you hope so, because you're a positive thinker. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you as a child you were a Christian? Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you sit in church, you hear the Word of God, you read your Bible? Did you know no, nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you serve in youth or children's or as an usher in the choir that you're going to get into heaven? You see, you and I can't get to heaven because of our actions. We can't get to heaven because of our thoughts. There's only one way to heaven, and that's God's way. You see, it's God's heaven. The only way you and I can get there is His way. So often we think, especially in America, that if we live a good life, well, I don't cheat on my taxes, I've never robbed a 7-Eleven, I wear uh, Tom's shoes, or I give the, the Red Cross. We think that if we're good people, we're going to get to heaven. Let me tell you something. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're a good person, you're going to get to heaven. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that our good deeds, according to God, are like filthy rags. Why? Because God's standard is perfection. And you and I have all fallen short of that. No matter what we do, we're never good enough to get into heaven on our own. Praise God, there's a hope, and that is Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus, as he was speaking to a religious leader of his day, John, in the third chapter, to the subject of eternal life, a man who had taught in the synagogue, the churches of his time, a man that had memorized the Bible or the scriptures of the, of the Word of God, a man that gave to the poor, sang the scripture, did all the right things, said all the right things. Jesus says to this man, in order to get to heaven, here it is, you must be born again. Hollywood, popular culture, society, whatever have you, They've made a mockery out of that. You think of weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity. But let me tell you something. To be honest with you, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, in the eyes of God, it's always meant the same thing. Here it is, and this is how it is. In order to get to heaven, it's an all or nothing relationship with God. Being born again simply means this, that you've given God all of your heart, you've given God all of your life. That's what God's after. It's not after your mental ascent towards Him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who He is. The Bible says the devil in hell and the demons in hell know who God is, but yet they're not going to find themselves in heaven. You can't just know who Jesus is and think that that's good enough. You've got to give Him your heart. You've got to give Him your life. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, people like you and I, hearing the Word of God, doing good things, and He says, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot. I better find you cold. He says it because if He finds you lukewarm, He'll vomit you from his mouth. Whoa. Shocking statement from the mouth of Jesus. And what he's saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all and will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let's define that in terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Lukewarm means simply that you're a little bit up and you're a little bit down, a little bit in, a little bit out, occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing your own thing, some of God's thing. You're kind of floating around, ping-ponging between doing uh, church and the world and back and forth and back and forth, riding the fence. What an uncomfortable and terrible position to be in. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you living lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking you're going to make it into the kingdom of God. Listen, I love you enough, I respect you enough to tell you the truth. Whether you accept it or not is between you and God. But let me not beat around the bush. The only way you can get to heaven is God's way. You can't get there your way, can't get there my way. We like to say, oh, well, God's a good God. God loved me. God loves me. So I'll find myself in heaven. Let me tell you something. Yeah, you're right. God loves you. He loves you enough to give His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you so that you could go and be with Him forever and ever and ever in heaven, leaving hell behind. You might even say, Pastor Luke, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in heaven. I don't even know where I stand on that. Let me tell you something. Just because you don't believe in it, just because you can't see it, because you can't feel it, you can't experience it right here, right now, doesn't mean it's not real. It's real enough for God to speak about it the creator of the universe, to tell us about it. Real enough for Jesus Christ to tell us about it. Real enough for the word of God to speak about it. Therefore, it's real enough for you and I to take it serious and quit playing games with God. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven my way. Well-meaning church committee or author's way. The only way we can get there is God's way. Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So tonight, let's not do it any other way but God's. Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father. Well, what does that mean? In a moment, here's what I want to do. I want to give you the opportunity to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever. To give him your heart, to give him your life. And here's what I'm going to do. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. Smack my hands together real loud. And in just a moment, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you the opportunity. When I smack my hands together, I want you to pop your hand. And what you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give him all my heart. I want to give God all my life. 
I want to make sure today I get into heaven. Listen, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. We'll go forward from there. You say, Pastor Luke, if I raise my hand, I'm going to be embarrassed. Somebody's going to see me. You know what? You might very well be embarrassed. Listen, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to blow smoke and mirrors in front of you. Today, you might be. But listen, wouldn't it be better to spend a moment of embarrassment right now than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm, welcome, and loving place with people who support you, who have done this alongside of you and before you? You see, we are all rooting for you today. So yeah, you might be embarrassed, but listen, let me encourage you to shed that moment of embarrassment and let's go forward in your relationship with God. Let's leave hell behind and headed for heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. Who should raise their hand in just a moment? If you've never given him your heart, you've never given him your life, in just a moment, if that's you, pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it. Who should raise your hand? Maybe you're not sure. Hey, maybe you did this at a Harvest or a Billy Graham crusade or on television, but you never really followed through with it today. Let's make that follow through the real deal. Go forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Hey, you're not sure? Don't walk out of this place without making sure. You know, that's a gamble on your eternal life you can't afford to make. Don't walk out of this place without making sure. Finally, who should raise your hands? If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, if you've been running from God instead of to God, hey, you're not wholehearted for God, not wholehearted against Him, kind of in the middle. Listen, if that's you today, let's make this the day you ensure your place for eternity. Shed in hell, shed in your own selfish desires, humbling yourself and becoming a standout Christian like we talked about tonight. Today is the day of your salvation. You see, the Bible says that it's the goodness of God that draws men to it's not about man. It's not about the person next to you, in front of you, beside you. It's about you and God right now. Don't let anything distract you. Don't let anything pull you away. If God is speaking to you in a moment, if that's you, get ready. This is the moment of your salvation. Whether you're in the front or you're in the back, in the family rooms, in the foyer, walking around campus, in the bathrooms, wherever you're at, get ready. Watch it online. If this is you, if I'm speaking to you right now, get ready. Your moment of salvation is right at hand. This is a new day for you. Get ready. In a moment when I count to three, pop your hand up, we'll, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, we'll do it all together, and we'll go forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't miss this opportunity. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. Where are you at today? You want to give them all your heart? You want to give them all your life? I see that hand right there. Where are you at? Let me see your hands. Put them up high so I can see it. Two, I see you right there. Where are you? I see people pointing over here. Three, four, I see you. Five, I see you right over there. Five wise people. I got you guys right over there. I got you right over there already. Five wise people. I see you pointing over this direction. Where are you at? Give me your hand. Six, seven, I see you guys back there. Seven wise people. Eight, nine, I got you guys back there. Nine wise people. In the family rooms, in the foyer, wherever you're at, nine wise people. Say, hey, I didn't embarrass them. I'm not going to embarrass you. Where are you at today? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. Slap yourself. Come on, get rid of that. Let's go forward in your relationship with God today. Nine wise people, listen, come on. Today is your day. Let's go forward for God. Nine wise people, where are you at? Number 10, oh, I can feel you in this place. Say, man, I wonder if I should. God is speaking to you. Don't start the first few moments of your potential life in rebellion today. Come on, if that's you, get ready. Let's go. Pop your hand up so I can see it. Nine wise people, where are you at? I'm going to close this up in just a moment. Nine, there you are, number 10, I got you. Ten wise people. Hey, praise God for ten wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. For those of you that raised your hand, wherever you're at, from the front to the back, wherever you're at, listen, you raised your hand. You said, I want to give them all my heart. I want to give them all my life. Let's go forward for God today. Here's what I want to do. In just a moment, we're all going to stand. Elijah's going to sing a song. If that's you, if you raised your hand, or you should have raised your hand. If it's important enough for you to do that, it's important enough for you to follow through the right way. What we're going to do is Elijah sings a song and we all stand in just a moment. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. Hey, a friend, if you need a friend, if you brought somebody or somebody came with you, look to them and say, I'll go with you. And I want you to get out of your chair, get out of your seat, get in the aisle and come meet me here at the altar. And let's change destinies together. Let us help you today. Come on, if that's you, let's all stand together. Please, nobody leave right now. If that's you, if you raise your hand, come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair. You can come. Come on.
Hey, listen, guys, you came. I'll tell you what, today is a new day. Did you know this? Let me tell you something. You're not going to go to a funeral. Hey, you're going to a birthday celebration. It's your birthday today. You're going to be born again. Listen, here's what we're going to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? He's a pretty cool guy. This is Pastor Joel, like Noel, Joel, all right? Pastor Joel is going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. Listen, I promise, listen, you saw me, you know, but I'm as weird as it gets, okay? He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by making Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior and asking to be your Lord and Savior. So we're going to lead you in a prayer real easy. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free literature. A really simple, small, easy to read, little tiny, <laughs> little tiny thing. A book called Welcome to Your Destiny. It's, it's just some simple principles of, hey, you just got saved. Now what do you do to help you get strong in the ways of the Lord? Third thing he's going to do, the best one of them, well, minus the first one, obviously. Is he's going to give you a friend. We give away friends here at the Rock Church World Diver Center. We call them spiritual personal trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer, somebody helps you make sure that you're working out the right way, not wasting your time. A spiritual personal trainer is a friend. Somebody will meet with you before service. They'll buy you a cup of coffee, teach you some things for five weeks so that you get strong in the ways of God. You don't go back to the life that you came from so that you go forward in your potential. And you'd be like we talked about tonight, stand out Christians. So if you guys would just go to your left, my right, right over here with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son, and that you sent Him for me, and that He died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that His blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.